I'm a negotiator, I'm a litigator, you know, I'm known as the people's lawyer. A good litigator is someone who can, can talk on their feet, someone who can, with, with little preparation, get up and defend someone or, or speak on someone's behalf, be very per, per, persuasive on what they say. Someone who really has a good handle of the law and someone who is not only articulate, but knows how to communicate with people. That makes a great litigator. I grew up in Philadelphia. So there was a, a big thing to be a Philadelphia lawyer. There's been books written about it. There's been so many great lawyers that came out of Philadelphia. One of the things that, that really inspires me is to be a motivator. You know, I'm, I'm a positive person. I'm someone that wants to motivate other people. I want to be able to put a message out there. I want to convince people to, to take a positive step to help people with their individual problems or, or whatever it may be. And me as someone in the media and someone who is outspoken, and I hope that that's what my message does. The interesting thing in the decree is it identifies specific acts um, that police officers committed but further, it shows that there was a pattern in practice that superiors knew about or condoned or didn't do anything about. That in itself is going to make the municipality, which is Chicago in this case, liable or responsible, and they're going to have to pay the ticket. Usually what happens is when you file a lawsuit in a, uh, a civil rights case trying to uh, uh, sue a police officer for excessive force, you have to not only prove that the police officer actually use excessive force, but you got to show that his superiors knew about it and it, and it was an ongoing pattern in practice. Um, in this particular case, the consent decree already lays that out. So it's, it's almost as if they're admitting facts. So now what happens? Who is going to pay for all these lawsuits that are going to have to be settled and resolved? And is, is the, the, the federal posture to the federal judiciary? Well, listen, every police department has internal affairs. Internal affairs is really the police agency within the police department. They're supposed to police the police. The question is, is how independent and fair they are. The old age problem has been that, you know, you have your own people basically watching themselves and uh, it never really has a, a good sense or smell of, of being independent. You know, one of the things that should be accomplished here is maybe an independent agency, something detached from the local police department, I think would be more helpful. But what happens is when there is an incident in the community, you're supposed to immediately report it to the internal affairs and an independent and full investigation should be complete. Whether that generally happens or not in the past, it doesn't look like it, but hopefully they can make this much better. But you don't have, you don't have an invasion of privacy. You, you waive that. There's no, privacy is your expectation of privacy. If, if you're in your house um, and you have, uh, you know, your, your shutters closed, you know, you have an expectation of privacy. So if someone is trying to uh, video record you without your consent or your knowledge, they're invading your privacy. In this particular instance, you're buying a device knowing that it's going to record your information and transmit it to a third party. It, it tells you on the box. Once that happens, you have now waived, waived your right or waived your, your privacy right. The bigger issue becomes is that information that is sitting on a third party server, that being Amazon, can that information be released? And that becomes the legal debate between the investigating agency and the consumer, and, and in this case, Amazon. And that uh, was subject to, to an issue in a criminal investigation that, we, that was hot in the press uh, not too long ago. One of the key things that happens when someone comes into a lawyer's office, the first thing the lawyer would say is, that, do you have social media? Stay away from it. At that point, I don't want you to go on it, and that's because we know that the other side, the defense side, is immediately, immediately going to go to that individual's social media, go to that person's uh, technical devices, such as a cell phone, to see what kind of text they may have had during the course of this incident, and it becomes critical pieces of evidence that can make or break cases. On the criminal side, when someone is charged with a crime, obviously this also becomes a key component because there may be evidence, whether it's direct or circumstantial, that could either implicate or in some cases could cut the person loose. And in, that also becomes helpful for the criminal defense attorney who may go out and seek social media evidence or whatever. But the, these devices, the social media is, is unfortunately a roadmap that's already being. You know, it's going to be interesting here with Robert Mueller, special prosecutor. 
you know, will he subpoena Donald Trump's tax returns? And how is that applicable in this case? Well, it's very applicable because you've got to remember Donald Trump is a, a global real estate mogul for all these years. He dealt with international foreign people, specifically Russia. And it's very easy to get uh, an enormous amount of funding to, um, you know, launder money. So he never won. He keeps continuing to say he's under audit. But can now the pro this special prosecutor get these tax returns out if on Mueller, the table? <clears throat> if Mueller asks for that... Uh, Donald, President Trump has to turn it over? Well, he's going to, he's going to issue a subpoena. He's going to be subject to turn those returns over. And the question is, are they going to scrutinize those records? I think yesterday Donald Trump was sending a clear message by hiring that attorney, that personal attorney that came out and made a pretty, pretty clear and concise statement. He was swift about it. He says, listen, if you're going to come after me, I'm going to fight you hard. I don't really think that they want to disturb what's going on with the president trying to move forward. But it's going to be interesting. The one thing you got to look at is... Bill Cosby, when this incident happened, this was back in 05, he was in his 60s. This was a smart man, a very powerful man, yes. a man with much resources where he could have had a litany of attorneys. He decided to come forward and speak to the mom and tell the story. He decided to go and see the detectives and tell his story. He decided to take his deposition and tell a story, always consistent. So here's a guy that's being honest. He's admitting to what he did. He said, I'm wrong, but it was consensual. And maybe he's going to tell the same story next week. And I think the jury may believe him only because of his longstanding reputation uh, on a national level. Is that going to affect this investigation or the case, the trial going forward, if there is one? Well, he's, he's basically confessed. So now the question is, does he take uh, the road of insanity defense? Uh, and he can mount it. It's a very difficult defense. He definitely has documented mental illness. The question is, can they prove that he didn't really understand the crimes he was committing? Very hard to do in the state. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, even if he's still um, found, he's found guilty of murder, then he still has a second phase, a death penalty phase, if he would have went that way. And uh, chances are that they would have never given him the death penalty. That's why I don't understand why, why he was so quick to confess. What's going to happen, you can rest assured, they're going to tighten up the noose a little bit. Joseph Marone is one of the country's foremost catastrophic injury and real estate attorneys. Based in Philadelphia, Marone and his firm have already been contacted by several families of victims of the Oakland fire. He's working closely with at least one of those parties on a possible action. If you own a building, especially a commercial building, you have an obligation to make sure all codes are correct, that you lift up all standards. At the same time, Marone says if the actual building owner wasn't fully aware of what was going on inside, didn't know about what these pictures show, much of the focus and potential accountability falls on the person whose name is on the lease. Derek Ion Almina. It seems like this individual who was responsible for the building really, really did not pay attention on uh, how to correctly manage a building and do, do the things necessary that ultimately may have caused these problems. That's correct. The totality of the circumstances is all the evidence, all the evidence that, that went into this case. I think when the, the attorneys speak out for the families, I think they do that in passion and, and on behalf of the families. But I think what you have to do is look at the facts that led up to this incident, what led up to the shooting itself. There's evidence, and, and pretty definitive evidence, that uh, this officer was undercover at the time, did see Mr. Scott with a gun before this event. He knew that this uh, gentleman possessed a gun. He made a call to have other officers come to the scene. So they knew that uh, Mr. Scott had, had a, a gun at the time.